Hey, it's Greg here with MaritimeGardening.com and this video is going to be about uh, developing a garden plan. I'm going to walk you through uh, uh, last year's plan and how that turned out and then uh, it's going to be a two-part video. The first part is going to, I'm going to walk you through last year's plan and how it actually played out uh, as I was putting things in the garden because you always make adjustments so I'll talk you through why I made some of those things and uh, just a bit of uh, pontification about uh, how to decide where things should go. And then the second part of the video, which, which I'll, I'll put up at a later date, we'll talk about the 2019 plan and all the things I want to do with that. I did a video like this last year and, it, and I think it got fairly good, um, people were kind of interested in that sort of thing, so I thought I'd do another one. You know, really I, I think what this really benefits is someone who's either A, overwhelmed with having a large garden, or, or B, uh, is uh, thinking about uh, you know, growing the garden, making the garden larger, and thinking, how am I going to manage that? How am I going to deal with all of that? So this is just going to walk you through my process. You know, I've got a full-time job, and uh, I do the garden and the YouTube and podcast. I do it all in my spare time. So I really don't have a lot of time for my garden, believe it or not, because the, the podcast and the YouTube videos actually eat up a lot of time. Um, and there's my full-time job, my commute, my kids, and all that. You know, we all have busy lives, right? So I thought it would be beneficial for people to just... Uh, listen to the inner workings of my mind uh, working through this sort of thing. Uh, so the first step is just going to walk through the uh, uh, my pr plan for last year's garden and how it all turned out. And I should mention just as a begin, this video was brought to you by my sponsor Vessi Seeds, but more on that later. So here we have um, a picture of the plan. I do this all in Excel. I mean every year uh, I take a picture of my garden and then I label where everything went and then the next year um, you look at that picture and you, you make a couple notes you know usually around the fall I'll make notes like what went wrong uh, ideas for next year because you always have ideas as the uh, season progresses but just to show you I mean I've been I do it in Excel you can use anything you want I've, I've watched lots of um, uh, websites where they where they talk about this sort of thing and people talk about buying special software for planning out your garden. I think that's ridiculous. I mean, really, uh, if you're not software savvy or if you want to save money, take a picture, go to a printing center, get them to print off a big, you know, like uh, 11 by 17 uh, uh, print of the picture of your garden and just write on it with a pen. <laughs> right? That's, that's the easiest way. I don't know, it costs like a buck, right? Um, and um, I don't know what that costs, but it's relatively inexpensive to do because I've done it with maps lots of times. Um, I use Excel because I work with it every day and I'm really familiar with it and it's very easy to label where you can just put these, uh, this is just what they call a text box and you just, you just, you know, paste text boxes in, you, you move them around and label where everything went. I've been doing this in 2014 so you can see the progression of, of my garden. That's 2000, so it's 2014, 2015, 2016 plan and the actual, uh, you know, so you can see um, around 2016 I started getting a little more sophisticated where I'll have a plan that I devise around this time of year when I'm ordering seeds and then in uh, at the end of the season I'll write down what I actually did. You can see 2016 I said kale, green, squash and then uh, the actual garden was like kale, Swiss chard, corn, <laughs> right? so I didn't follow the plan. <laughs> um, uh, you, you never do but it's good to have a plan. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, in 2017, you got a plan and you know slightly different uh, location of things for the garden. And 2018 was no no different. So this picture is a picture of my garden at the um, at the end of 2017. So this is not my 2018 garden. This is a picture of my garden at the end, right? Because this was 2000, my 2017 garden. And then in 2018, using that picture, I developed a plan, right? Uh, and then I relabeled that 2018 garden. So all the pictures you're going to be looking at are actually of my 2017 garden, but I'm going to be talking about my 2018 garden. I hope that's not confusing for people. Uh, the main thing is don't don't uh, think too much about the picture you're seeing. Uh, think more about the um, the the labels, right? Because that's what matters. It's just deciding where things should go. Um, I took a picture of my garden a couple of days ago. This is what it looks like now, and I'm still working on the 2019. This is the two, you know, this is 2019 plan. The garden's got you know slightly different uh, organization, and uh, don't don't pay attention to the labels here. A lot of them are going to change many times before I make up my mind. But I'm not done with that. That'll be a whole separate video on its own. 
Um, so number one, why, why would you want to plan? And I've mentioned this before. Um, as the spring rolls in, um, there's two main reasons to avoid being overwhelmed with all the decisions you have to make in the spring and not making lousy decisions. Right? Start thinking about this in late January when you're thinking about buying seeds and you can mull it over. Right? You can see what it looks like, change your mind, think things through. Right? Go on with the plan. There's an old saying, um, plan your work then work your plan. Right? It's a good saying. So that's one really good reason so that in April, you know, let's say you, you come home from work and you have supper and you throw on your jeans and you go out in your garden and maybe you've got half an hour to work but you don't want to have to think about anything it's like okay I need beans gotta go here go right um, so you can get a lot more done because you're not and I know people that garden a lot do this you just stand there staring oh if I do this then I have to do that but if I do this I have to do that and if I do this I have to do that and you waste it it's not really a waste of time I enjoy just staring at my garden and thinking about things and coming up with uh, hatching schemes and plans and stuff but if you know when it's time to start planting uh, every particular thing has an optimum time to be planted and if you miss that window of time you're really not uh, gonna get the best results so it's kinda go time you kinda start putting seeds in the ground so the great thing about having a plan is on any given night you really don't have to do a lot of thinking because you've already done the thinking you've planned it out like a strategy uh, another reason to have a plan and I do this before I buy my seeds is to not go crazy buying seeds um, right because that's something uh, people do um, you, you go to the uh, uh, you know however you buy your seeds you go to a garden center and there's a wall of seeds and you just start buying oh I want this and I want I want I want I want you start buying right and you end up buying stuff you, you some of those things you're just not going to plant so if I look at my list here this is all the uh, seeds I ordered last year from Bessie's and here's a long list there's probably like uh, it's like a 37 item list <laughs> kind of thing right uh, there's a number of things I didn't plan there's also a couple things here that I really didn't uh, care for but more on that later I mean you know, it's a question of your own taste and so on and so forth but I did not plant um, uh, what do we got here uh, the collards I did not plant I no particular reason I just uh, for whatever reason you know it was like uh, you know July or August and I'm like wait a minute I forgot to plant my collards um, so I don't know why that's the case I just, just didn't plant them um, what else didn't I plant uh, leeks I didn't plant leeks yeah I, I had them in my garden plan but uh, things happened and I didn't plant the leeks um, and uh, oh, there's probably something else here uh, onions I didn't plant so I, I, I bought stereon onion, onion sets which worked out really well and I ordered these things called North Star um, Onions. I also actually didn't plant this stuff. Astro arugula salad green. I didn't plant still have the package in my in my kit there. So uh, uh, I meant to plant onion seeds. I just kept pushing it off and, and, and I forgot to do it and then it was too late because onions need a long time to if you're gonna get any real size out of them, right? Um, especially when you got a short growing season like me. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> didn't plant those. So there's like four things there I didn't plant. So it's it's really important to uh, you know every year review what you did the year before and think <laughs> right come up with a plan and try to stick with it as best you can but don't uh, beat yourself up if you uh, uh, diverge from your plan um, so let's walk and well one more point I wanted to make is uh, when you're coming up with your plan when you're trying to decide what to grow um, and I think a lot of people you know a good deal of my content is based on what I hear people say when I'm sort of talking to ordinary people uh, often at work who've tried gardening and don't think it's worth their time or uh, have a small garden or, you know basically just think people say to me candidly about gardening and one thing people always say is oh I had way too many tomatoes I didn't know what to do with them I had too many beans I didn't know what to do with them I had too many of this I didn't know what to do with it and I think a lot of that just comes down to planning uh, you should think about everything you're growing in your garden and think about when that thing is going to be ready for harvest how much are you going to get and can you handle what the harvest is going to be uh, will you be able to keep up with the harvest will you be able to eat it all as fast as it comes off the plant uh, do you have some way of uh, preserving it that results in something you like right I mean you can you can preserve something and then you got this can of stuff or a mason jar full of uh, some preserved vegetable and no one in your house likes it <laughs> right <laughs> so I, I'll give you a good example I, I got a ridiculous amount of garlic in my garden I think I probably got 200 heads uh, planted for this season and I love garlic and but one thing that 
before you get the garlic, you've got to cut all the uh, garlic scapes off. It's these little green things that stick at the top. And uh, I pickle them, but nobody in the house eats the garlic scape pickles. Um, and, and I like them, and I, I actually add them as ingredients to certain dishes and so on. But really, two uh, half-gallon mason jars of uh, garlic scape, uh, pickled garlic scapes is all the pickled garlic scape I want for a year. Because it's just me eating it, and there's only so much of it you can eat. Uh, so what are you going to do with all that? I have found if you make a kind of pesto out of it, uh, which you can freeze, um, it's a really good use. Uh, also, when those garlic uh, scapes are ready to come off, you tend to get your first uh, really good yield off of your perennial herbs. So I just throw it all in a food processor. But anyway, we're getting off topic here. Um, think about what's coming out. You don't, I mean, a lot of people plant way too many zucchini and don't know what to do with their zucchini, right? If you plant like, you know, for me, a, a 4x8 bed of zucchini. I've, I've tried it before. I've had more than that, and it's just too much. A 4x8 zucchini provides my family all the zucchini we want to eat and enough to make a good... I, my, my wife loves uh, zucchini relish, so it tends to provide all the zucchini relish we could possibly want. Same with a, a 4x10 uh, garden of um, pickling cucumbers. I can barely keep up with the number of... And that's like maybe um, 8 plants or something like that. Uh, six or eight plants, I can't remember now. Maybe ten. Anyway, all the cucumbers you could possibly ever want for pickling. Uh, so you don't want to plant more than that, right? So you got to think about that's, that's one pack, right? It's all, one pack's all you're going to need of pickling cucumbers. Uh, so all those things, you know, you, you as you're making your plan and you get better at this sort of thing every year, you you think back over your past experience and you got a picture of everything in front of you, so it helps jog your memory of things and um, you can come up with a better uh, idea of what you actually need to buy and what you're probably not going to be able to use. Um, also, you can have uh, notes. Uh, do I have any here? Look at my 2017 plan. Yeah, so in 2017, I said build more hoop houses, uh, peppers need plastic. I could have sworn with this one. I must have deleted it or something, but I had a note. Is it here? Where'd that go? Yes, so I got a whole bunch of notes um, for my 2018 garden uh, of things not to do. <laughs> Usually it's things not to do. Uh, sometimes it's things to do. I, I said stop, stop buying borage, stop planting it. And it's a, it's really easy to grow and it's a nice plant. But I mean, people always say, oh, it's a wonderful salad green and it tastes like uh, cucumbers. Uh, and you know, it does kind of taste like cucumbers, but it has a texture of a thistle. Um, so it doesn't feel good in your mouth. You certainly can't get a child to eat it unless you've got a really, you know, open-minded child that'll eat just about anything. Um, it has a thistle-like texture in the mouth, uh, raw, and the only way to, for it to taste like cucumbers is raw. Um, and you know what tastes more like cucumbers? Cucumbers. They, they taste exactly. Like, cucumbers taste exactly like cucumbers, uh, and they have the texture of cucumbers, and they don't have the texture of thistles. So yeah, I'm done with borage, and I know someone's going to say, "Well, oh, you should plant borage. It attracts pollinators." Look, my garden is surrounded by meadow trees, weeds. There are flowers everywhere. You can see them in the foreground here, right, in this picture. And not only that, but in the garden, you know, at the time of year when I need pollinators, there, everything's in bloom. My beans are in bloom. My squash are in bloom. Bloom. My cucumbers are in bloom. Everything that blooms is blooming in the garden. The potatoes are blooming. <laughs> everything, the strawberries, you know, everything is on. So, I mean, if you're standing in the garden in uh, late July, uh, it just sounds like a giant beehive. It's all you can hear. When my kids were young, they didn't want to go in it. The sound <laughs> of all those bees. Right? Kids tend to be scared of bees. Um, so, yeah, I don't really need, like, one... A borage plant to you know <laughs> somehow make make the make up the difference. And you know, if you like borage, go for it. Whatever. Uh, what else did I say down here? Uh, dry leeks, right? Because I just keep uh, forgetting to plant them, and they're a nice thing to plant. Uh, reminded myself to direct seed the onions and use this thing called inside outside approach. An idea I had. I'm not going to talk about that here, but um, maybe uh, late March I'll sow my onions and I'll show you to follow up what I mean by the inside outside approach. I think is a great way to do this. It's just an idea I had for this year. I think it'll work. Um, uh, more succession planting. I'm going to talk more about that as the video goes on when I discuss my garden plan. Um, 
and plant two beds of carrots. So I need more carrots than I, I didn't plant enough carrots last year. And uh, I basically, I think we ate our last of the stored carrots this past weekend, right? It's around the end of January right now. So I didn't plant enough of them. And we were being very judicious. I really, I need two four by eight beds of carrots to have, uh, you know, enough to last until they start to go, uh, you know, too, too rubbery and stuff like that. And uh, I also told myself, because last year there was a, a, a variety of potato I just love called Superior. Uh, but they're not scab resistant. And my entire garden, even areas like, you can see in this picture right here, it says potatoes and there's an arrow because I started a new garden. So over here I planted Superiors. And this soil has never been cultivated, right? It's just wildness, wildness, right? Never been cultivated, never nothing, right? And I planted... Uh, uh, superior variety potatoes on that st stretch of land there and they had scab <laughs> despite the fact of being like virgin soil right so I don't know what what this what the deal is in my site and these were um, you know certified seed potatoes so they're supposed to be totally free of things like that so my, my takeaway is that my entire garden is basically inundated with scab and that's kind of a drag because it limits what you can plant. But there are varieties of potato that are very resistant to it. Um, I've talked about that in previous videos. I don't want to get into that here. But basically, don't waste your time. Because <laughs> when the potatoes have scab, um, they just don't uh, keep as well. Um, and you certainly don't want to leave them in the ground any longer than you should. Because the, 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 the skin is compromised. And the skin is what preserves the potato. So um, I, I made myself that. And that's another good reason to have a plan like this. But... Let's get into the meat of this episode and what I'm going to talk about. So 2018, I had a plan, right? Here's what I want to do. That's what you're looking at here. And uh, uh, let's start on the, uh, the right-hand side over here where it says kale and parsnips. And I'm just going to talk about, I'm going to try to do this quickly, but what I had planned to do and then what I actually did. So I planned to put parsnips, beets, kale. That's not what's in these gardens in this picture. That's just what I was telling myself to do. Um, can't remember what was in here. Um, those look like carrots, actually. Um, but anyway, I was telling myself 2018, so I must have planted carrots there in 2017. Um, so I'll plant parsnips here and plant beets here. This looked like some sort of uh, lettucey thing. I don't know what that was. Um, anyway, what did I do? I stuck with the plant parsnips and beets. Good. Um, over here, I said plant kale. And what did I do? I planted carrots. I can't remember why, but I planted kale over there. Um, I think I planted carrots down here. That's what happened. So I told myself to plant carrots and spinach down here. Okay, this is a, a two-foot, front-to-back, two-foot garden that goes all along this fence. If you, if you look really close, you can see a fence back here that's to keep the deer out. So I have a garden going all the length of here, and I told myself to put carrots and spinach there. And uh, our rabbit got in and just ate them all. <laughs> And I didn't even, I don't think I even planted spinach here. I think I just planted carrots here, a whole bunch of it. And I thought I'd have a really good carrot crop. And I came up one day and they just all disappeared. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't quite sure what was going on, but I figured there was a rabbit that had gotten through the fence and it just stayed in this sort of, uh, there's a lot of bushes here, so it probably feels safer here. I, I've noticed the rabbits don't tend to get into the boxes. Every once in a while I get a young, uh, my fence is like a, two inch by three inch mesh and it keeps um, a full grown rabbit out um, but it doesn't keep the baby rabbits out so they'll get in and they can do a lot of damage with really young plants they can take out you know, in one night they can take out you know an entire bed of carrots <laughs> this is not not much to it the carrots are let's say when the shoots are two inches high uh, there's, it's not much for a rabbit to eat that and they like they like the little tender shoots like that so that's when they do their damage is when things are tender and they get in your garden and in early spring they're they're, they're everything is mating and growing and trying to get as much into them as they can so I found the garden with boxes when a baby rabbit gets in they don't wander into the boxes even I mean these are only six inches above grade right they're, they're really small um, but the rabbits will run, wander into these uh, rock bordered gardens probably because it feels more natural or something they'll get in there but they won't go in these boxes so the carrots had failed I think I ended up just jamming some beans in the ground um, and I I, I took a couple guesses where the rabbit was coming in and sort of short up the fence. I would just put some extra chicken wire on the outside of the fence, and I didn't have any problems after that. Uh, but then I put kale over here um, to make use of that space. Uh, I think over here, um, 
sorry, I put carrots over, not kale, I put carrots, I put carrots over here because the carrots on this spot failed, so I ended up going with carrots, I should, I actually should change that, it's actually beans, right, that's what happened over there, with the beans, um, so yeah, I ended up putting carrots here because the, the carrots uh, that were supposed to go here failed, um, now over uh, here, I said plant spinach, and that's what I did, I got a really neat video that I, I shot end of February last year where I used a couple old windows, and uh, made a very temporary cold frame to early sow spinach. I mean, normally in this part of the world, you, you don't sow seeds in late February. Um, and, and often is the case, uh, if you sow seeds, like if you just have bare earth and you sow a seed in, in April, it might not germinate till May because uh, it's just so cool and the, and the soil has got so much uh, cold in it. And I fear we're going to have a year like that again this year because they're supposed to be one of those polar vortex things. Uh, I'm trying to find a scientist that'll come on the podcast to talk about that. Anyway, I told myself to put spinach here, and that's what I did. But then the spinach was basically done by sometime in um, oh uh, July or something like that. And uh, we had a really late frost in late June, killed everything. Um, so around uh, yeah the end of June. Uh, last couple weeks of June we had these devastating frosts killed everything and then I went to Cuba for a week and uh, was basically away from my garden for 10 days and then I came back and uh, uh, I, had, I had had eggplant transplants growing in one of my cold frames and everything in my just about everything in my cold frames last year despite the fact being in cold frames they all died in late June from frost everything was vaporized um, so I went to the garden center and bought some eggplant and stuck them in because the spinach was done, right? It was all, you know, spinach is just bolts and it's, when it gets warm and it's done. Um, here in the plan, I said to make, uh, to plant cucumbers and leeks. This is a rectangular bed here. And, uh, I ended up just planting onions and I planted onion sets, in fact. Uh, it was just one of those days where I, had, I was after work and I had half an hour and I had a, I think it was the Sturian onion. So I said I got an hour to, do something in the garden, plant those onions. I think that probably only took about 15 minutes. But uh, yeah, I just stuck the onion sets in the ground and that was that. And then I just you know, broke the plan. Um, everything else I think I pretty much stuck to them. No, I didn't. I broke. So I would planned to put cucumbers here and squash here. And that's what it... Now, the previous year, I had, my general system for the garden is whatever is... This is the east side over here, right? So basically, I, I try to move things from east... To west. I move everything over one. So last year I had um, cucumbers in this bed where it says spinach and collards and I had um, summer squash here. So then the following year I moved those over one. I put the cucumbers here and the squash here. Right? So 2019 I'll put cucumbers here and squash here. Right? So everything gets moved over one and the thing that follows them isn't of that same fall, uh, family, right? So I will not put a cucurbit, you know, any sort of, any squashy, cucumbery type thing. That's not what's going to go in these spots because uh, I grew that last year. That way, you know, the different plants have a harbor different pests and have slightly different uh, needs of a soil, different demands of a soil. So you're always moving things around. This is just a really system, uh, simple system. Generally speaking, you know, I just keep moving things over. And then when something gets all the way over here, I just move it back to here the next year, right? So that's, that's all I do. And uh, break those rules all the time, but if you generally stick with that system, it's almost like the turning of a tide, right? I, you know, I, I don't have to think too much about it. Basically, I'm just going from left to right, and uh, just and then re, you know, recycle, start it all over again. Uh, and you break the rules here and there, and move things around whenever you feel like it, and it all just seems to work out, <laughs> right? And, you know, remember, I'm always always mulching everything too, so the soil is always being renewed by. Um, the uh, the activity of the organisms in the soil that break down the mulch and, and do that sort of stuff. So it, it's just my sort of low low intellect, <laughs> you know, uh, lazy way of doing crop rotation with really not putting much, too much thought into it, and it gives you the freedom to just improvise and do whatever you want. Um, down here, I wrote spinach, collards, onions, kale, mosh. It's two beds. There's a this four by four by eight bed here, and there's a four by eight bed here. And the plan was to plant spinach early under a dome, which I did. And then when the spinach gave up, to sow collards. Because they, they, I've had a hard time getting collards to germinate without any, you no, know, really previous to um, June. They, they really don't like the cold. And, and 
maybe I held back on the collars because we were still getting frost like the third week of June here, like really hard frost. Like you'd come out and the, the hose would be frozen. There was ice in the hose. There'd be ice on my pond, right? The little buckets of water, rainwater would be frozen, right? In late June. Um, and I know collards can't stand, uh, I, at least I have found they, in this part of the world, uh, they don't seem to like too much cold. Um, so, and in this garden I had onions, kale, and mosh, and I did a video. This garden went all the pieces, it got all weedy. Uh, I planted mosh, and uh, turns out I don't like like it. I've, I've heard, uh, I'm a big fan of a um, YouTube channel called One Yard Revolution. The guys always talking about mosh, corn mosh, and how good it is, and he grows it all winter long. So I said, oh, I'm going to try that. I mean, you know, he's a vegetarian, he probably knows a lot about vegetables, and I'm sure he does. But uh, turns out uh, I don't like mosh, and no one in my house does either. <laughs> No, I'm not going to bother planting that again. Um, it, it tastes kind of like lettuce, but with no flavor. I mean, it would it would be a useful thing if 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 it would be better than starving to death. You know, if I was starving, I'd probably like mush. Um, but uh, I'm not in that situation. Uh, if the world ever goes to pieces and I have to somehow try to survive on my garden, I'll incorporate mush into the rotation uh, because it's one of the earliest greens you're going to have. It's a really cold resistant green and and uh, to a large extent, even the winter won't kill it. And it's self-seeding, so it's got a lot going for it. But one of the drawbacks is that it's a very uninteresting taste in my book. Um, and my wife's all about salads. So, I mean, anyway, that's just, if you like it, go for it, whatever. But I'm done with that. So, so I pulled all the mosh out. At some point in the season, I was like, ah, this stuff's awful. No one likes it. So I just pulled it all out because I said I can be growing something else here. And uh, the onions I grew here... They were, they were being crowded out by all the other things growing. They just didn't have the room. So I made this whole garden a kale garden. I just moved the kale around. I had so much kale in this garden. Um, and I'd sown the kale and the onions and the mosh here under a plastic dome in March. Uh, so I had like all that growing, but also an incredible amount of weeds. I didn't do anything to deal with weeds in that garden. I have a great system using cardboard. I was lazy and didn't do it in that garden for whatever reason. It was just overrun with weeds. And I had a video where I put that whole thing back to rights. And part of that process was just migrating half the kale that was in this bed into this uh, spinach bed. So spinach was done. So I ended up from, from one bed of uh, March sown kale getting two beds. And I actually brought some spinach. I had some, um, oh, like a lacinato type uh, kale that was growing in one of my cold frames that I sown early as well. And I moved that all out of the cold frame uh, late May or something like that over into this spinach bed as well. So I had two different kinds of, if you see my videos, you'll see I had like two different kinds of kale. I had uh, my own, what's it called, like white Russian kale or something like that, and uh, or wild Russian kale, or um, what's that stuff called? Uh, wild garden mix. And I bought some of this wild garden mix kale, but I also have my own seeds. I had a, I had a kale go to seed one year and I saved the seeds and basically my favorite kale, this sort of mystery kale that I I got going. Uh, I still have an entire pill bottle full of uh, those kale seeds. Uh, it's just great stuff. Okay, so that's how I arrived at that decision. Now, before I move on, let me just say a word about my uh, sponsor, uh, Vessi Seeds. This is my second year with Vessi's, and um, they're uh, an online uh, seed provider. They're basically set up. I mean, they have a, they have like one store in PEI, as I understand it. PEI is a province in Canada. Um, you can order from Vessi's if you live in Canada or the United States. I'm sorry for people that are in other parts of the world. Um, they don't ship outside of Canada and the U.S. probably as a result, as a result of some kind of rule about importing and exporting of seeds, I would imagine. Um, anyway, um, they've got an online store. Um, I ordered all my seeds from them last year. I mean, of course, they provide, they provide my seeds for free. Uh, but I also did mid mid year. I ordered a couple times from them and just paid with my own money just to see what that experience would be like, and everything was perfect and seamless. Another great thing about Vessi Seeds, which I like, is that if you order something like potatoes or um, you can buy apple trees from them, you can buy all kinds of different things from them. Um, they won't send it to you until it's time to put it in the ground, right? So they're very sensitive to that sort of thing. So I ordered potatoes. Uh, in February, I didn't get potatoes the next day. They they keep them ideally stored where they are, and they ship the potatoes to you. You know, basically around the time of year, it's time to start thinking about planting potatoes. So I guess it would have been like mid-April or late May, late April when this. I can't remember exactly when, but they you know they didn't send them before it was time to put them in the ground. Uh, same thing with any sort of uh, you know perennial uh, 
fruit tree or whatever, right? You can get, uh, you know, look at all the, the selection, apples, blackberries, um, uh, was it apples, blackberries, blueberries, cherries, currants, da, 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 right? Broad selection of herbs and vegetables. Uh, for those that don't know, it's it's a company that started um, in this part of the world, uh, oh, was it 60 years, 70 years ago, something like that? And um, they're specialized, they, they have their own um, research garden where they, they test, they they test and grow all the all the varieties they they ordered in, and they get their seeds from different providers. But they test them all out to see how they perform, and with an with a with a mind to see how they perform here in particular, where we just don't have ideal growing conditions. The um, I can't remember his first name, but the the man who started the company started it out of his basically out of his kitchen, right? <laughs> it's one of those uh, uh, originally a mom and pop type organization. Uh, trying to get varieties that grow well here where it's, it's foggy and, and less than ideal growing conditions. I mean, if you live somewhere else where you've got a lot of sun and start, that sort of thing, everything probably, all these varieties will probably just grow a lot faster, <laughs> right? So, um, uh, anyway, that, that's, you know, a brief, and I've done other videos on their history and that sort of thing, but um, if you order from Best Seed Seeds and use, the, they've provided a coupon code for my viewers the code I'll put it up on the screen here it's, and it's also in the description box of this video G A V S 1 9 G A V S 1 9 if you use that coupon code with your order all the shipping's free so you can order like 10 apple trees and you get them shipped for free the only catch is that you have to order at least one pack of seeds um, with that order and that activates the coupon code uh, I can't remember why they had that rule. It was something about way, the way their ordering systems work. So whatever you order, get a pack of seeds with it, and you're always going to order seeds anyway, and the shipping's free. And the only catch is uh, if you order something like a rototiller, which they sell. They sell tools, right? They have a pretty good selection of tools. In fact, they even have uh, the Homey Digger. Uh, uh, where is that? I, I can't see it here, but anyway, the, the Homey Digger, which I'm always, people are always asking me, oh my God, you can actually buy that at Fessies. They didn't start selling that because of me. They always have. This happens to be the case that they sell that. Um, uh, but anyway, if you were, let, let's say you wanted to buy a homey digger, I think Bessie sells them for 20 bucks or something like that. Uh, as long as you got a pack of seeds with it, you, you get it shipped for free. Right? So the, the only thing uh, you'd have to pay an extra surcharge is if you've got an oversized item, something really big, something really heavy. Um, but, uh, you know, most things uh, don't fall into that category. They've, they've got... Um, Somewhere on their website, they have an explanation of that. Of course, you could call them and ask about that. And also, I think I've got more details about that in the description box. Anyway, back to the video. Um, I'm not going to have a, a huge plug for Vessies on every one of my videos from now on, but that's just the deal I have with them this year that I do my garden tour videos, I would say, brought to you by Vessi Seeds, and I do a little plug. Um, so, and this is kind of like a garden tour video. There's really not a lot going out in my garden. My garden right now is just frozen. I did a video just a week ago where I was seeing which beds were frozen solid and, and which of the different techniques I used, the hoop houses and all that sort of stuff, had kept the beds from frozen. It was kind of like a garden tour. Anyway, once a month I tend to do a garden tour, and this year all of those garden tours are brought to you by Bessie Seeds, and that's why I'm talking about them. So, <laughs> moving on. Um, and they're great. They're a great company. I'm really, really happy that they're working with me. Um, the garden plan, uh, plan 2018 was to put beans here, beans here, right? Um, and uh, along the, this is a slope here that faces south, south is over this direction. Uh, what did I actually do? I did follow through with the bean plan, and uh, that's, just, that's what I planted. It's not what the picture shows you, because this is from a previous year, but it doesn't matter. Uh, but along here, I didn't plant, uh, I didn't, whoops, uh, I wanted to plant chard along this base here, and I did not. I didn't plant any Swiss chard. I can't remember why. I just I just went crazy. I planted a ton of parsnips. I just thought, parsnips store so well. Why don't I plant a lot of them? Um, so, I, and I didn't. I, mean, I still have, so I've run out of carrots, but I've got lots of parsnips, and I love them. I think my kids are a little fonder of carrots. They're a little sweeter, but um, they're coming along with, they're, 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 they're warming up to the parsnip, I guess. Um. So, uh, yeah, I planted a lot of parsnips, and I'm happy with the number I planted last year, but I went a little light on the carrots. Um, I think down here, I was supposed to plant peas and potatoes, and I can't remember why, but I just planted potatoes, and I had a really good crop there. I think there were the Norlands, I think, or there might have been Red Chieftains. Uh, down here, I was supposed to plant peas and potatoes, and I did, as I recall. Um, here, I was supposed to plant beans. And I did. I had two kinds of beans here. I had bush beans, and then down the center I planted a 
a row with a trellis of climbing beans. I think they're about seven feet high. And uh, you know, if, you, if you're interested, that's a great system. I got that. I think I got that idea from Robert Pavlis, uh, who had a he's a, a gardening book author, and I've had him on my podcast a couple times, and he had mentioned that to me. Um, and uh, it works really good. You, you have a bed, let's say something like four by eight or whatever, and you put bush beans in the whole thing, and then uh, right down the center with the trellis, you plant climbing beans. And of course, the bush beans grow really fast, and they 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 they, they give you their yield uh, very soon. They're they're fast yielding and pole beans, uh, climbing beans take a lot longer to give you a yield. So when the bush beans are starting to start uh, starting to go off and they're not good anymore, you've got the uh, the pole beans to enjoy. So uh, that's a great system. You basically get two crops of beans out of one garden and one planting session. So uh, I totally recommend that. I think of beans and potatoes down here. Uh, a bit lower, I was supposed to put uh, lettuce down here and I didn't. I put uh, uh, what did, I, what did I say here? I was supposed to. I think when I was making the plan, I said put lettuce here. But when uh, the season started progressing, uh, it actually was the case that I, I'd forgotten all about it. But I'd plant. There's a there's a bed here about three feet wide by twelve feet long. I had planted garlic the previous fall, so the whole thing was garlic. Now one thing I did was, um, you know, you some you start you harvest all your garlic sometime. For me anyway, it depends on when the garlic's ready to be harvested and how it looks and how it appears. And I've done videos on that. Um, but for me, it tends to be, you know, all the garlic comes out sometime in late August. Um, but I started pulling garlic out of the ground in July um, because I don't want to buy garlic anymore. And I got all this garlic in my garden. It's not at its peak, but it's pretty darn close in July. Um, so in July, I still often will have, uh, you know, your squashes, your pumpkins and, and different kinds of winter squashes are still very small. And, and if you're careful, can be moved. So what I did in that garlic bed is I... I pulled garlic out in clumps so I'd make a little space and then I jammed squash in there. And then by the time I pulled all the garlic out of there, uh, the squash just took, took over the head, bed. And, and you can see from some of my garden tour videos, uh, around uh, late September, that whole bed was full of squash leaves. I mean, and I got my, my I think my largest squash of that variety, I think it was called Winter Sweet, uh, which I got from Bessie Seeds. Uh, that was the biggest squash I got. Uh, so it worked out really well, um, and that's a kind of, I want to talk a bit more about that in this video, and the next one, uh, there's a two-part video on the garden plan, but this sort of a kind of succession planting, I mean, the way that the concept of succession planting has always been conveyed to me, it's planting lettuce every two weeks to get lettuce all summer long, which that's fine, um, but I'm far more intrigued, because that sounds boring to me in, in a sense, right, it's more very chore-like. Uh, I'm much more intrigued by growing one particular crop in a space and then at just the right time moving another crop into that space and basically getting the most uh, yield out of your out of your soil uh, in, in a way that's really you know dovetails which just the one crop complements the other and they go they go well and, and no magical thing about you know uh, this plant likes that plant and I, who the hell knows about that but I'm just talking about the two things working well, you get a really good yield out of one, you put another one in, you get a good yield out of that, and it's, it's low maintenance, it works great, and, it, and you're moving them all at just the right time anyway. And so by the time the garlic are coming out, uh, I tend to plant my squashes and pumpkins and cucumbers in groups of two or three. Right? If I want one cucumber to grow, I plant three. There's a number of reasons for that. Sometimes uh, one or two of them will get taken out by slugs overnight. Or maybe one of them just uh, one of the seeds isn't viable. You just never know, right? Uh, I find that the, the uh, Vessi seeds uh, tend to have a really good uh, viability rate, very good germination rate. But you just never know what's going to happen. You always have to plant at least two. And I find for cucumbers because I've got, um, you know, depending on the bed or where I am, there there can be uh, snails and slugs that can do some serious damage if you don't get the uh, the, uh, the slug bait that I use down. Um, so. When it's time to thin out the squash and the cucumbers and things like that, um, every place where I've planted, where I want one plant to be, there's at least two and sometimes three, so I've got to move those things around. Um, so it's nice to have a, a hole to jam one of those in rather than to just throw it in the compost bin if you get a place to put it. Especially, I mean, the cucumbers is one thing, but the winter squash, you really can't have too many of them because they keep so well. I've got nine big squash, bigger than my head. <laughs> in my garage, well, they might not all be bigger than my head, but a good number of them are. I've got nine 
big squash um, in, in the garage right now uh, just waiting to be eaten. Right? You really can't have too much. Of certain things, you really can't have too much. Uh, potatoes, squash, there's just certain things you really can't. You know, if you don't know what to put somewhere, put squash or potatoes there or something that stores well like a parsnip. Uh, parsnips store much better than carrots in my opinion um, because you can store that easily. There's no work to storing it. You just like pick it, spread it out in a blanket, dry it out a bit, stick it in a box, put it somewhere that's uh, you know, not too warm and uh, eat them at your leisure sort of thing, right? So um, that's another thing about coming up with a plan. It's like trying not to have too much of one thing and knowing what things you can have tons of anyway is not a big issue. Um, and down here, I think in the plan I said to put uh, peas and potatoes, but I got a strawberry garden all around the perimeter and over the course of the season it just went to hell. It really did. It became inundated with weeds uh, migrating in from the surrounding forest and it just, not only that, but I just decided that the design of it was just un unmanageable. I, I couldn't really get in there without walking all over the soil and I decided to do a complete redesign of that, which I began last fall and I got some videos on that uh, if you're interested in that and talking through what I didn't like about that approach. It was a simple and easy way to, to get something in the ground there, but it, over time I just didn't find I was in there managing it, and so it would just get you know progressively weedy, which I don't tend to have weeds in, in most of my garden, but at the edge of the garden where the forest is, things just come in. The, the roots come underground and up. Um, I mean, there's, there's just there's things wrong in the woods where the roots can travel 10, 20 feet and pop up somewhere. So <laughs> that's, you know, the edge of the garden is ground zero and zero uh, for things coming in. And here I am not managing it. So I decided to just pluck out some of the new uh, young strawberries and stick them in a little, like a little triangular shaped garden down here. And I put them in other places as well. So let's move on to that part. So um, this garden goes all the way to the left here. You can see this little uh, stand thing. Actually, this bench is falling apart. I have to build a new one. I might even make a video on that. I love having a sort of nice sawhorse bench in the garden. I didn't even have one most of the summer last year because it, it collapsed. It just rotted out. Um, so over here um, I made an asparagus garden. Uh, that was the plan and I followed through with it. Right. Let's go down here. Made an asparagus garden down here uh, which came. I planted those direct seed and I can't recommend that enough. Uh, I mean every person I've talked to said oh I did the the transplants and I'm so happy with it. I did the transplants and I was not. <laughs> I'm so much happier with these. I've done both and I like the seeds, but uh, and sure I might have to wait next year, but I think I got a good. Uh, I mean, when you buy a transplant, you're getting a variety that um, stores well in that form, right? When you plant a seed, um, you probably get more more selection, more options. Um, anyway, I've found these ones. Uh, uh, all my transplants seem to get attacked. All my trans so along the back here, this this area down here against the fence, I, I planted transplanted asparagus crowns, and every year when they poke up, they get hammered by snails and slugs like you wouldn't believe. And if I'm not right on it, I, I basically lose most of what grows, right? Uh, whereas these ones, I noticed when they came up, nothing bothered them at all. It's not like there wasn't snails and slugs here, right? Um, uh, I, this was a garlic garden uh, in tw 2018. I'm going to put, uh, I think I, I moved uh, late in the fall of 2018, I moved strawberries into that. Uh, I moved strawberries into lots of places like uh, where the, these beans are. This is all, that's all strawberries now. I moved a whole bunch of strawberries and I'm really curious to see if they survive the winter. But I try to get the strawberries. See, previously the strawberries are all growing over here in this outer edge. And you can see it's in a bit of a shade, right? It's not optimal. For strawberries, they like a lot of sun. So I thought, because this is south over here, right? So they're in the shade of, of these trees. So I thought if they're at the far end of the garden, because there's, there's nothing in the way, nothing with real height like trees, nothing as high as trees. I thought if they're at the far end of the garden, I've got apple trees here, I've got blueberry bushes here, I've got um, oh Saskatoons, I've got a number of different bush type things here, and uh, fruit type things. Basically, this is the fruit section. So I thought, why not just go with that theme and plant more strawberries and, and that sort of stuff. So that's what I did. And anyway, uh, the plan also uh, was to um, use the cold frames uh, strategically to, to uh, I started some, um, oh, I started kale in the cold frames in March and then moved the kale out in, uh, I don't know, mid to late um, uh, May. And then I direct seeded tomatoes in the cold frame, but we had this insane frost with I think I mentioned earlier. I mean, an inc unbelievable frost in late June. And all the tomatoes I had growing, 
I was really interested to see these tomatoes because they were basically everything resistant tomatoes provided by Vessi Seeds. Um, anyway, everything that was in my cold frames uh, got vaporized. Even, I mean, to give you a sense of how cold it was, now at that point in time in the garden, it was June, late June, uh, my, my um, Swiss chard and kale was not under cover or anything like that. And the plants survived the frost, but almost all the leaves, like 85% of the foliage on my Swiss chard and kale died in one night from that frost. That's how cold. Just the thing just froze solid. Uh, and, you know, I find uh, in the fall, maybe because the kale plants mature, uh, it can take having its leaves, fro leaves frozen every night. But when the plant's young like that, maybe because the roots aren't very deep, I don't know, um, the leaves don't survive the frost. Um, so a lot of literature on that uh, is misleading. It'll say it can handle frost. Yeah, it can handle frost when it's mature, but it can't handle a hard frost when it's young. I can tell you. I mean, you go back and watch my videos, you'll see. It cannot handle it, right? I mean, the plant, well, I guess it can handle it if you, the plant lived. Those plants came back. But I lost. <laughs> I mean, they're basically, you know, there was enough foliage on them. It was like harvest, right? They were uh, vaporized. So, I mean, the plant really suffered from that. They should have been covered. I didn't cover them because I was like, oh, they can handle frost. Everybody says they can handle frost. Well, they don't handle so much. Uh, anyway, so I, I, I ended up reseeding some of the best tomatoes I got. In this bed, the third cold frame, I got these <laughs> seeds from a dollar store. I think they were like a beefsteak and stuck them in the ground. Uh, that was after the ones uh, in this bed had died. And the peppers also had died. I mean, they just died. And I was with the lids down and everything in a, in a half decent cold frame. Uh, so I'd lost everything, and uh, where I work is next to, there's a dollar store. Uh, sometimes I wander around there on my lunch break, and I uh, just grabbed some cheap, cheap dollar store tomatoes and stuck them in the ground, and they all grew, and they, they, had, they were amazing. They were huge tomato plants. They worked out really well. Big, you know, weird shape, but great, great flavor, and just a great tomato. Um, anyway, uh, and then there's the area outside the garden, right, where uh, I can't remember what I planned to do. I planned to plant onions there, there's five beds here and one of them uh, had, had garlic in it so I planned to put onions porridge leeks and tomatoes and uh, I didn't bother with porridge and <laughs> I planted uh, tomatoes potatoes uh, onions and squash tomatoes and squash and garlic with the squash I mean all I did was plant uh, one or two plants at the very on the right hand side of the bed you can see these beds are sort of like um, eight feet long by four feet wide and I planted the squash on the outer edge and just let the foliage spill out over the grass and stuff. And it's just a good way to, you know, why have the bed be filled up with squash foliage? Uh, the foliage doesn't need to be in the bed. The roots need to be in the bed with the good soil. Uh, in fact, if the foliage is, is spread, I didn't really do this, but um, it's a great trick. If the foliage spreads it over the grass, uh, there are certain nodes along the, the vines that if you can get them uh, in contact with soil, they'll, they'll add more roots to the structure of the plant uh, and, and they, they can actually do that in the grass as well if you just scuff the grass up a bit and put a bit of a you know bit of, bit of compost down they'll, they'll do that fine um, also I would plan to just not grow anything else but it seems like every year I, I seem to want to do a little more uh, so uh, I made a potato bed over here maybe uh, four by eight on this and I'm gonna extend that and do a bit more I'm, I'm kind of reaching the edge of what I'm able to manage on my own, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> One of these years. <laughs> my kids are getting, you know, I got an 8 year old and a 10 year old in a couple of years. Jeez, I'll be able to put half, pawn half the work off on them. Uh, then I'll be flying. That'll be great. Uh, so, anyway, um, so that is how I arrived at my 2018 garden. And, um, you know, I'll show a couple of pictures of the results I get just as I'm, I'm signing off in this video. Um, I'm going to do another video uh, uh, later in the week when I've got time talking about what I'm planning to do for 2019. Um, I've begun this. Don't don't pay attention to anything that's written here. This is, these are just labels to be changed. I haven't really made all, all my final decisions yet, and I've got a lot more decisions to make. Um, this is just a picture of the garden as it looks right now, uh, where everything's just frozen. There, i got more to do here. More on that later. Let's not get ahead of ourselves here. So I hope you found that interesting, and it gave you some some uh, good ideas for uh, planning your garden out and helped you uh, or gave you an opportunity to um, listen to the inner workings uh, of a, the, the mind of a gardener with uh, some degree of experience and a fairly large garden and uh, 
you know, sharing my uh, my successes and failures and the, the trial and error and that sort of thing. And every year I, I learn something new and I, I come up with some new uh, scheme or trick and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And, um, you know, sometimes you have an idea and it doesn't work, but it's not because it was a bad idea. Maybe you just executed it in a wrong. I mean, a lot of people will try something and it doesn't work and they just think that thing doesn't work because they tried it once. Maybe your execution was poor. Maybe, right? I mean, I think it's weird. I'd love to make like a set of, uh, you know, gardener's virtues. One of them is to be stubborn, right? Keep trying. Uh, keep trying, but adjust your, your plan. But another one is to not be stubborn. Some things just like, you notice there's no corn. If you go back in previous years, I used to always say, this is 2007. This is 2000, my 2016 garden. I grew corn. And, uh, I mean, I got half decent looking size stocks. We just don't get a lot of sun where I am. And we don't get a lot of uh, uh, heat because uh, it's so foggy and overcast so often due to our proximity to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so you don't get really big impressive ears of corn uh, and you know I like everything to be big and lush and everything like that right so uh, I uh, <laughs> uh, I think I, I might have tried to grow corn in 2017 I can't remember but I basically gave up in 2019 I said forget corn forget it it's, it's just not worth your while um, and uh, there's other things like that too uh, what was it initially I have an old picture here you can see the garden, uh, there's these little circles here. See all these beds are little circles? They look really pretty. And it creates, you know, I got some really nice pictures from it. It's got these little teepees growing over it and so on. It was very ornate, but it was a useless use of the space. I even, I think I wrote that. Those circle gardens don't make good use of the space, consolidate. So you can see I went from that design to having these, you know, less less ornate type thing but much better I mean you're getting way more area out of it. And it still looks nice I mean basically if, you, if the plants look good and everything's growing to me it looks nice um, anyway I'm getting off on a tangent here I'm supposed to be wrapping up the video I hope that was useful for you and I gave you some good ideas um, stay tuned for that second video where I talk about the 2019 garden and the garden 2019 plan uh, if you enjoy this, pretty, this video please like share subscribe um, check out my podcast maritimegardening.com where I talk about this sort of stuff and the ideas of gardening and I'm trying to line up some interesting guests for the 2019 season. I think you'll find it very interesting. And uh, until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden, and have fun buying your seeds. It's seed buying season. Uh, thanks for listening.